Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about the actual cells themselves. I love this slide because it, it kind of summarizes what's going to happen throughout the next couple of videos. And then here you can see the sheet of epithelial cells. You can see this one cell being affected by some kind of a chemical agent. So it's being injured is the, the term you want to be familiar with. And then it moves away from the rest of the cells. Something changed in it and it knows it doesn't belong. So it starts going through these morphologic changes and this is the cell of progression. It has all these changes on the inside, changes on the outside that help identify that this is not a normal cell anymore. And then a macrophage comes cruising along, swallows it up, and then cleans it away from the system. So it's kind of an interesting progress of going from a normal cell to an injured cell to an adapting cell and then destroyed. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So this first area of review, I'm going to spend some time, I don't usually spend very much time on reviewing anatomy and physiology, but to understand what's going on in the cellular environment basically over the next month, you really have to remember what's in a cell. Every cell in the body is going to be very similar in what holds on the inside, the basic processes that it does, how it sustains life. So understanding this, this section or reviewing these main points is kind of important to me. Right. You have to first remember there are two types of cells in the human body. There are eukaryotes and prokaryotes. The eukaryotes actually make up you. They are human cells. Um, not all eukaryotes. An exception to the rule is that uh, yeast or, or fungus are actually eukaryotic cells. But all the cells of you are eukaryotes. I like to think of them as more fragile. They actually have this plasma membrane that you, you remember. It's kind of squishy. It's kind of wobbly. They call it the fluid mosaic model. But it's really important because it allows two cells to connect to each other, it allows cells to communicate, and a lot of processes we're going to talk about in just a little bit. When you look at a prokaryote, which is typically going to be a bacterial cell, prokaryotes, they have a plasma membrane, but they also have a cell wall that goes underneath it. So they have the cell wall that helps protect them because they live alone. Your cells depend on each other. They work together as a team. If one cell fails, it starts pulling the others down. So, uh, and that's when tissue destruction happens. But a bacteria can live all by itself in a totally you know, different environment from other bacteria. So it has its protective structures. The difference between these cells are where it's significant in understanding the pathophysiology and, and what it takes to get rid of some of these bacterial cells. So first you want to know about the outside membrane. Second, their chemical composition. When you look at the DNA and the RNA design, we're very similar. Everything that's alive has to have DNA and RNA. We just know that. But the way that it stores the DNA is different. DNA inside of a human cell, a eukaryotic cell, is actually in the nucleus. So it's protected in this thick membrane. But the DNA inside of a bacteria is in an area called nucleoid, which doesn't have a protective membrane around it. It's just kind of like lumped together in there. So we'll talk about this when, it, when we talk about um, micro, uh, microbes and microbiology a little bit. And then the last one is the, the, uh, the biochemical activity. So the way that the human cell, the eukaryotic cell, makes energy is through two processes, which we'll talk about, and you know that the major organelle is mitochondria. When you look at a bacteria, evolutionarily speaking, the mitochondria, they believe, were bacteria at one time. They were really good at making energy, so we just pulled them into our cell and we used their energy. We harnessed them. So we kind of like domesticated them in our cells. But the way that you make energy in a bacteria is a little bit different. So we can target these differences when we try and kill the bacteria or um, control the bacteria or regulate the bacteria. And we'll talk about those. So the first thing you want to remember is eukaryote versus prokaryote. And there's some specific cell differences between the two. The second thing you want to know is that normal functioning of eukaryotic cells depends on what we call the cell theory and the eight basic functions. So cell theory is like this universal statement that says all cells are the basic functional units of life. So anything smaller than a cell isn't alive, hence viruses are not cells. We'll explain that later, or talk about it again later. The activity of the organism depends on the activity of all of its cells. So as an organism, the whole group of all of our collective cells depend on every cell doing its job. When you have cells that fail, you have, you have failure of tissues. Tissues fail, you have failure of systems. When systems fail, you have failure of the organ, organ system. And then organ systems fail, organism fails. It all depends on the cell. So when we treat medically, we usually treat at the level of the cell, like give chemicals that affect cells, not whole tissues, but individual cells that correct the whole tissue, which correct the, the whole organ, which correct the whole system and correct the organism. So everything depends on the cell, and that's why we're going to do the review. Next are the biochemical activities of the cell are dictated by their organelles. What's inside the cell determines 
specialized functions. This is really important when you think of things like a, um, well, lysosomes and peroxisomes. They help break down waste products inside the cell. So what organ in your body do you think is going to have cells that are full of peroxisomes and lysosomes to break down toxins and things that shouldn't be in your body? And I'm hoping you're thinking the liver or maybe cells of the immune system, and you're right. So when you look and you understand the organelles, you can understand what the purpose of that cell is. You can understand what organ it's going to work best in. And then the last one is the continuity of life has a cellular basis, which means that cells don't just spontaneously you know, pop up in the middle air. Cells come from cells. Every cell comes from another cell. And that's just the cell theory of life. When you look at the functions, all cells have to have these capabilities with a few exceptions. Because as a cell is made, when it's originally a stem cell, it has to do all eight things. As it starts maturing, it differentiates and specializes, then it doesn't have to do everything. Like, for instance, when a um, neuron specializes, it doesn't have to be able to reproduce anymore. When you look at um, specialization of some cells, like for movement, muscle cells are full of actin and myosin because they need that contraction ability. All cells have to be able to excrete waste. They have to be able to metabolize and generate energy. They have to be able to secrete some things. Um, like almost all the cells in your body have an endocrine-like function. And we'll talk about that later too. Actually, you probably learned it in physiology. And then all cells have to communicate to let them know what's going on in the body. So these are the basic functions and the basic cell theory. You break these, you break the cell, you break the organism. You, you break the cells or lose the ability to replicate, you stop the ability for life to, to continue from one generation to the next. We'll talk about those things too. So just thinking about the basic cell theory, the eight basic functions, and the two different types of cells in the body, it kind of gives you an explanation of, of why penicillin kills bacteria but doesn't kill us. So when you think of penicillin, penicillin, penicillin actually works on cell walls. So think about it. Why does it not kill you but it kills bacteria? It's hard to say that without actually giving it away. So think about it for just a second. If penicillin destroys a cell wall, you don't have cell walls. Bacteria do. So when you look at this, what would happen if you um, took a drug that cut DNA? So if the DNA, if it just cut general DNA, it could affect you. But when it cuts specific DNA that are in bacteria, it can destroy lots of things. It prevents the bacteria from being able to replicate that DNA, which means it can't make RNA, which means it can't make proteins, which means it can't protect itself or make energy or make a cell wall or do any of those things. So when we give drugs that block certain functions of the bacteria, it's because it's affecting directly into that bacteria, like a cell wall. You can see a couple drugs that affect cell wall. You can take them and you live through it because it doesn't hurt you as a eukaryote you know, collection. All right, next major concept, and this is something you want to have written down somewhere or captured from a slide, but the disease process. This is what happens. The first thing that happens is the cell da is damaged. Something's exposed to the cell, whether it's a chemical, physical change, um, smashing a cell, heating a cell, it's some kind of a damage. That cell has to adapt. So as it's adapting, the whole tissue struggles. So let's say you're damaging the cell by depriving it of oxygen. The whole tissue is going to start struggling. If it's a skin tissue, you might see hair falling out, nails getting dry and brittle or falling out, skin sloughing off. That's the cell adapting. That whole tissue overall is trying to struggle and it's adapting. And then the organism overall compensates. So we'll try and adapt to this. These are processes that happen initially. Here is the line drawn in the sand. So we're adapting just fine. At this point, we're reversible because the organism's compensating. We're staying alive. But at the point where you cross this and the cell fails, it's all downhill from there. When the cell fails, the tissues collectively fail. When the tissues fail, the system fails. When the systems fail, the organism fails, and we die. So. It's just this pathway. The whole point of adaptation is to try and maintain life of the cell until you can overcome the problem. Right now, when we treat tissues that are damaged, we treat them at the cell level. We treat to try and nurture the cell, to bring the cell back. We, we provide it fluids, we provide it nutrients, we pro provide it with whatever it needs to stay alive, and then we hope that the organism can compensate and come back 
If at the point where the cell starts failing, there's no coming back, and that leads to death. Right? Symptoms are just signs of these things happening. So symptoms are signs that the cells are adapting at first, and then they're signs that the cell didn't adapt. Like through this, you see change, like I mentioned, hair falling out, nails becoming brittle, skin sloughing off. At this point, you start seeing necrosis. So we'll talk about necrosis with cell death, tissue death, systems dying, and then the organism itself dying when we need to. But there's a process, and that's what you need to be familiar with right now. So here's an example of, of the disease process. So this is carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide gets into the red blood cell and it blocks or binds to the hemoglobin protein. So you know hemoglobin carries oxygen through your blood. Since myoglobin is similar to hemoglobin, it blocks the myoglobin too. So it goes to your heart and gets into your heart tissue and binds to the myoglobin so your heart can't store oxygen. In either one of these situations, you're going to feel like you have a lack of oxygen. You, and you should be able to predict the symptoms because of that. How do you feel when you're not getting enough oxygen? Not carbon dioxide, I'm talking oxygen. If you remember your physiology, the signs are you feel tired, you feel weak, your mental processes slow down, you just feel exhausted, you just want to take a nap, and then unfortunately if it's because of CO um, poisoning, you could potentially die. Right. Here's the next process that happens. The mitochondrial enzymes don't work. They're not getting oxygen is the way you want to think of that. So now you're depending on what process to keep you alive. It's not oxidative phosphorylation because mitochondria is not working. What process makes energy when you don't have oxygen? Glycolysis. So glycolysis is cranking up. And with glycolysis, you're making lactic acid. You're, you're burning sugar really quickly, but you're not using oxygen. So it's a very inefficient process. So you feel tired a lot. You're not making enough ATP. Lipids start peroxidizing, which means that neuron, the lipid coating, starts getting changed. What's that going to do to signals, transmission of signals? It's going to slow them down. Right? So think of things like myelin sheath or the lipid membrane. You're not going to get quick action potentials. You start feeling more tired. You start feeling relaxed. Those are signs of CO poisoning. They're kind of, I love that word, insidious. They kind of creep up on you slowly. Right? So what would you expect to happen to your heart rate? What would you expect to happen to muscle contractions or brain during ex acute exposures? So heart rate may actually speed up a little bit. Why would the heart rate try to speed up? To pump more oxygen, right? The muscles are going to feel tired or weak really quick. The brain starts slowing down. Those are all signs. And if you look online, you can actually some, see some of the rates, like what happens when you have 10% carbon monoxide bound to hemoglobin? What happens to 15%? What happens at 25%? And you can see the progression. So at 10%, typically no symptoms, because heavy smokers usually have 9 to 10% carbon monoxide in their blood at any time. So you just see symptoms like you're a smoker. Right? Once it's at 15%, you might get a little bit of a headache. You want, might want to take a nap. Not a good idea. 25% you start feeling a little bit more nauseous. But at that point, you're probably already asleep and you just have upset stomach. Right? And then 30%, 40%, by 45% you're unconscious and at 50% leads to death. So there's a progression. With chronic exposure, think of what happens to a smoker. Right? What happens to their blood flow? What happens to the cell structures? I mean, all the things that happen to a smoker would happen to you during chronic exposure. So you kind of understand the patterns. And then the cell itself, you have to keep in mind that the cell is a precision machine. Every organelle has a purpose. Every organelle has a function, and it all has to be working in perfect timing, basically, for everything to work right. It's just like these gears. If one gear is out of place, nothing works. If the mitochondria is out of place and not working, nothing else is going to work properly. It's going to struggle and not keep good time. So you always want to think of the cell as being this precision machine. Here are the major parts of the cell you need to pay attention to. So the first one is the plasma lemma, which is also known as the plasma membrane that goes around the outside. The organelles are the little structures floating in between. And then the cytoplasm is the liquid or the plasma inside the cell, cytoplasm, right? three primary components. There we go. So the first one, the plasma lemma. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of why you need to know this with the pathophysiology. But the first one is the fluid mosaic model. So 
The fluid mosaic model means this, it's fluidy. It moves constantly. It means it's not always the same and it's constantly changing. Receptors that are on the surface of your cell now are not going to be the same receptors that are there five minutes from now. They're going to constantly be changed. They get activated, degraded, and replaced. They're constantly changing. Right? If you affect any of these things like the lipids, the proteins, or the carbs in the membrane, it changes the membrane's function. And we're going to go through each of these one at a time. Like for instance, we'll talk about the lipids. Cholesterol is important to allow fluidity in this membrane, but is it possible to get too much cholesterol? Yeah, cholesterol can get sticky. It can slow down the transport of things like oxygen and CO2 across the membrane. So too much cholesterol can be a bad thing. The way your body processes cholesterol can affect how much cholesterol is in your, your cells. The proteins, we'll talk about those. Proteins get denatured, which if you remember, means change the shape. You change the shape of a protein that acts like an enzyme and a receptor, and that receptor or enzyme doesn't work anymore, which means that function in the cell stops. And we'll talk about some of those. Carbohydrates, typically they're for communication. They have other purposes, but I always think of carbohydrates as communicators. So they help identify the cell. Like for instance, when HIV binds to a cell, it looks for the glycocalyx, which is this carbohydrate fingerprint on the surface. Right. So just as an overview, you want to also keep, keep in mind what are, the, what are the components inside the cell versus the outside. These have a huge impact. Like, what are the sodium levels inside versus outside? When we get into next week's discussion of fluid and electrolytes, we're going to talk about this in better detail. But you really need to know it because it affects osmolarity how water moves across the membrane, how electricity flows across the membrane. So you want to remember those terms and remember the different chemicals like the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Right? You want to remember this whole thing about action potentials. An action potential doesn't have to be just a neuron. Action potentials can move down muscle cells. Every cell in your body actually has this electrical gradient. And when you look at certain chemicals that affect the electrical gradient, they can cause death or, you know, cease life, I guess, is another way to look at it. Like a lab I used to work in worked with a chemical called tetrodotoxin. It's the puffer fish venom. And when it gets in, it can actually block these sodium transporters, which causes sodium to stop moving back and forth across the membrane, which can cause stop of all electrical signals or even cardiac signals leading to death. So these action potentials or electrical imbalances or electrical changes are really important. Next, membrane dysfunctions. Like I said, you want to pay attention to things like proteins, cholesterol, or carbohydrates, lipids. Um, uh, one good example is cholesterol. If cholesterol starts accumulating in red blood cell walls, it slows down diffusion of oxygen. If it starts accumulating in the walls of the liver, same idea. It can cause cirrhosis of the liver, which we'll talk about when we talk about the, the hepatic section. The glycocalyx is talking about that fingerprint, the carbohydrates on the surface. HIV looks for specific carbohydrates on the surface. When it recognizes this human carbohydrate, it binds to it, pulls itself in. So a change in carbohydrates can make a big difference. A change in carbohydrates can also cause your immune system to attack that cell, which can cause dysfunctions. And of course, if it's your immune system attacking your own cells, it's called a what kind of disorder? Well, the immune system attacking self is called autoimmune. Right? These next slides, like I said, I'm just trying to give you the general overview. When you look at plasma proteins, there are lots and lots of plasma proteins. Cell proteins are lots of purposes. Moving things across the cell. Um, working as receptors. Working as enzymes. Helping to hold cells together. Helping with cell recognition. You change anything about the environment, like acidity. You make the environment too acidic, it changes these proteins and it stops the functions. And I'll give you some examples explanation or some ideas of this and when we get into specific systems I'm going to go into it better so just remind yourself of the different proteins All right one thing is proteins make enzymes you change the acidity of the blood it changes the enzymes in the blood you can't carry hormones properly you can't transfer things across the membrane properly um, the same thing with proteins in your digestive tract lactose intolerance is a good example if you change the protein or you're missing the the protein that makes the enzyme, it doesn't work properly. Enzymes are there for things like metabolism. So metabolism, like the mitochondrial metabolism of, of glucose, sugar, to make ATP. If you stop that, it doesn't work properly, it doesn't make ATP, and you will die. Right. Transport across the membrane, you want to think of things like pro, uh, protein transporters of sodium, potassium, 
Uh, it could be chloride, it could be glucose transporters. You change the environment, you change the way that it moves things. I think I've said that several times. Here are just some examples of transporters and their methods. Uh, active transport, of course you want to think of sodium potassium pumps. If you change these, you can't shift sodium potassium back and forth. You get imbalances, we'll talk about next week in the fluid acid base imbalances. Exocytosis and endocytosis. You want to think of these especially with white blood cells. So here's a white blood cell swallowing a germ. If you affect, um, for instance, mitochondria, mitochondria can't make energy, none of these processes happen. These are actually forms of active transport like pumps do. So mitochondria fail, your energy production fails, and the cell will fail. When you look at the mitochondria, I'm not going to go through and make you remember the Krebs cycle and uh, electron transport chain and all of that. You just want to keep in mind that all of this happens because of proteins. If you change those proteins, you change the ability to make energy or transport energy. Uh, the next video, we're actually going to talk about the mitochondria more specifically and what happens when you deprive it of oxygen. What happens inside of here? What disadvantages is it going to cause the cell? You might want to put a little star by this slide. This slide, you have to remember the two main processes of making energy. So glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorization, you want to remember that one little piece of sugar or glucose can actually be turned into about 36 ATP worth of energy. But you also want to remember what do you have to have present to make that energy. You need a sugar and oxygen. It goes through the mitochondria and turns into 36 ATP. Glycolysis, you don't need to have oxygen, so they call it anaerobic respiration. But unfortunately, you take one piece of glucose and you turn it into two ATP, and then do you remember those byproducts it makes? The things that can accumulate? I'll give you a hint, change the acidity of the environment. Lactic acids. Right? So when you're remembering these processes, if you can't go through oxidative phosphorization, you're not going to use energy or produce energy efficiently. Next organelles to remember. These are the groups called the membrane-bound organelles, ribosomes. They make proteins. So when you think of these, think of cells that have to make lots of proteins, like um, immune cells that make tons of antibodies. When you think of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it doesn't have the ribosomes, which is a rough endoplasmic reticulum, that makes proteins. So this modifies things like steroid hormones. It modifies um, phospholipids for the membrane of the cell. It helps remove toxins. So those are the important functions here. You're going to see a lot of this in organelles that are there for making hormones, or organelles, cells that are there for making hormones or removing toxins. The next one, the Golgi, packaging and shipping. So when we talk about storage disorders, so we'll look at the lysosome, the peroxisome, and the Golgi apparatus. If you can't package a, a product appropriately, and ship it through the Golgi, it's like that, that chemical doesn't even exist. So remember, this is the UPS, the shipping department, or the postal service of the cell for packaging and shipping. Some of those things that packages and ships are called lysosomes. Lysosomes, you want to remember, are there to break down or digest things that are unwanted. So a lysosome actually has about 40 different enzymes inside of it, and it can break down things like bacteria, process the bacteria, excrete the bacteria, but it also breaks down important things like fats, digests the fats to help you modify those to make important structures in a cell. So I'll talk in just a, a few slides about a few diseases that affect the lysosomes. The next one is the peroxisome, and the peroxisomes use hydrogen peroxide, and they actually use it to break down or kill things. It detoxifies harmful substances. So peroxisomes will help um, detoxify alcohol, formaldehyde, they'll help detoxify free radicals and help neutralize them. So you can see the byproducts of a peroxisome, it actually uses hydrogen peroxide and it ends up making water and oxygen out of it. So it has kind of a safe product it releases. The problem is that if the peroxisomes start popping, they dump lots and lots of hydrogen peroxide in the environment. And you know what hydrogen peroxide does to hair. Imagine what it's going to do to a cell. So it's very hazardous and very toxic. Right. And then the lysosomes and the peroxisomes, if you look at them, I kind of have this slide that shows. Here you can see a lysosome right next to a peroxisome. So the lysosome here is actually digesting a mitochondria that's not useful anymore. And then the peroxisome, you have these little fragments of structures. They look very similar. 
If you were to look at them and break them down, they both have lipid membranes. They both transport things. This has lots of hydrolytic enzymes. This has little oxidase crystals. Right? So um, one disease that we'll, we'll talk about later is something called Tay-Sachs. And Tay-Sachs is a lysosomal storage disease, which means the lysosomes are defective in these kids. It's really a terrible disorder. What happens is the children can't process lipids appropriately, and the lipids start accumulating in the neurons, and those are insulators. So they start blocking up electrical communication. So these children, they usually don't live beyond five years of age because when they first start developing, they look like a normal child, but about a year or, or two years into development, they start accumulating lots of these lipids inside their neurons, and so their neural progression degenerates. So they were just learning to speak, and they were learning to feed themselves, and now suddenly they can't feed themselves or speak, and then uh, they regress all the way to the point where they, they actually die. Okay. Next you want to think about is tissue formation. So those were organelles. When you have tissue formation, tissues, when they make new tissues, go through a process called mitosis. Meiosis is when you make gametes or reproductive cells, but otherwise all the processes in the body to help regenerate or fix you are called mitosis. Mitosis is really important to understand because um, mitosis allows a cell to replicate. There are steps of the cell replication that are important when we talk about cancer cells that you're going to have to remember and, and get familiar with. But for right now, for tissue formation to happen, you have to be able to stick cells together. So there are actually three ways that cells stick together. And you can see it in here. So cell adhesions. You have these cell junctions. Uh, like gap junctions that hold together. You can have tight junctions. You can also have desmosomes. And those are the three major ways these cell, cells hold together. Why that's important, again, with cancer. When a cancer cell starts mutating, it'll actually turn off these adhesions and it breaks free. What kind of risk would that have? If a cancer cell breaks free, so if it's a skin cancer cell, it was a tumor originally, now it's become cancerous, it's breaking free, and now it's moving into your blood, what does that mean? That means that cancer cell can move somewhere else in your body or metastasize to somewhere else in your body. It can cause a whole new cancer in another organ or system. So cell adhesions are going to be really important. You definitely want to refresh yourself on those. Here's another example. This isn't a cancer, but if you have dysfunction with these cell adhesions, they can actually cause the membranes to not hold together, and they can start peeling off of each other. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, herpes will actually do this. Herpes can get underneath the epithelial layer and start separating and cause little pustules. So fluid can build up in here and push outward and it causes that blister or pustule. We'll talk about the cell cycle, different steps of mitosis. So you'll definitely want to refresh yourself on that. We'll talk about growth factors or things that allow the cell to progress efficiently. In the cancer section, we're definitely going to go through. Typical cell cycle lasts about 12 to 24 hours. And here are the different phases. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Right. So why do you need to know normal physiology of the cell? Because cells behave in predictable fashions. If you know the, the basic functions of the cell, you can predict how they're going to progress. It's just like the whole disease overall. If you know the signs and symptoms of the disease, you can predict the changes. And then right now, we define abnormal function at the cellular level, so we treat at the cellular level. When you take a pharmacological agent, you're actually affecting the cells and the organelles inside the cells. And the last homework question of this slide set is actually, you're going to try and determine what the difference between typical pharmacology is and pharmacogenomics. So I want you to Google pharmacogenomics human genome project and then answer this question. What is pharmacogenomics? What's the advantage it has over traditional pharmacology? And what are the disadvantages it has? So, like I said, right now we're treating at cell level, but you're going to figure out where we're going to be targeting. And we'll talk about that in the next section.